Hello, welcome to Catalyst. Thanks for joining us this weekend as we continue to worship and gather across Ventura County as a church. I'd love to just invite you from your home to join us and put your hearts and your minds into these songs and prayers as we worship together. We sing this prayer together. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name And even in suffering Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be.
awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display Then we sing together And then sings my God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it on the cross and on that cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin yeah then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God everybody. Welcome to Catalyst Online. We are really uh, glad that you're joining us this morning as we are continuing through the book of Acts. Hey, before we jump into the sermon this morning, a couple of things I want to remind you of, let you know about, especially if you're uh, viewing for the first time this morning. First thing is this. We would love to know that you're participating with us this morning. Um, if you're one of our, our newer guests, do us a favor. Text Catalyst SP to 97000 and what's going to happen at that point is you will be texted back a link to our digital connect card and that is a great way to let us know that you're hanging out with us online also a great way to let us know if there's anything that uh, you would like us to know about yourself maybe there's something you'd like some prayer for we go over those prayer requests every week as a staff and we pray for those prayer requests maybe you're thinking of getting involved you want to join a team maybe you're thinking that now is the right time for you to take a next faith step and you want to get baptized if you have any questions about the church there's a comment section so please take advantage of texting catalyst sp to 97000 as a way to let us know you're hanging out with us this morning but also as a 
way to pass any information on to us or get any information back to you. A couple things coming up that I want to let you know about. Next weekend, Thanksgiving weekend, Everything's going to be online. There will not be a live service that weekend, so make sure you come back to Facebook or the links on our website to watch our services because everything will be done online Thanksgiving weekend. Also, the next thing I want to let you know about, if you would like to find out some more information about Catalyst, maybe you're a little new to either attending or watching us online, we've got an option for you, and it is called Discover Catalyst, and that's going to happen 7 p.m. on Monday night, December 7th, and what Discover Catalyst is, it's about a 45 to 60 minute Zoom meeting uh, hosted by Pastor Chris and myself where we share our story, our vision, our purpose, and even some potential next steps if you'd like to consider um, getting more involved here at Catalyst. So the way that you can register for that is to go on the Church Center uh, uh, Catalyst app. Registration is on there. Um, if you can't quite figure that out, uh, please again text Catalyst SP to 97000. Put in that comment section that you'd like to register for Discover Catalyst on December 7th. And then uh, as that gets a little bit closer, you'll get emailed the link so you can join that meeting. So hopefully you'll join us for that. Got some good stuff coming up that we want to share with you. Now we're going to uh, jump into Acts. Pastor Chris is going to lead us through the next chapter. Um, as we've been reading through the book of Acts together with our reading plan. So just praying that this message is a blessing to you. Ever started out something with the best of intentions and then never finish? I do, all the time. When it comes to home improvement projects, I like to say that I'm about like the 90% completion guy. I seem to always fall into the trap of getting about 90% of the job completed and then kind of like walking away from it. Like I get started, I get into it, I get mostly done, and then I say to myself, oh, like, that's pretty good. Like, I'll, I'll finish it tomorrow. I'll get back to this, and I'll finish it tomorrow, and I never do. In fact, there are a couple of examples that are glaring in my own home that remind me that I'm the 90% guy all the time. One of them is actually our backyard fence. Years ago, I was like, we need to repaint the backyard fence. We, my, we need to get this done. It's just bare wood. I want to paint it brown and make it look nice and all that kind of stuff. So me and my son Isaac went to the store. We got the paint, and we were going to do this project together like father and son. And so we started on the back fence and we got the whole back portion of it done, the whole span of the back. And then I said, you know what? We've worked really hard. Let's come back to it. We'll finish the fence tomorrow. Well, years later, the fence is still not finished. In fact, I, I didn't even get 90% of it done. I got about 60% of the fence done. But every time I go in my backyard, I'm reminded that I didn't finish the task that I had set out to do. The other glaring thing in my own home, and it comes to like the home improvement thing, is my baseboards. Is I've done some repair on some of the baseboards in our, in our home, and I never seem to get around to painting them the exact same way that the other baseboards were painted. So there's like corners and edges that are unfinished and they've never been painted the same way the other ones are. And so every time I go in my living room, I see these spots and I go, oh man, I never finished painting the baseboards. Eh, I'll get to it tomorrow. You probably have some of these things too, like where you've said it with the most of impure intentions that I'm going to do this. I'm going to finish this project and then something happens and you don't complete the task. The goal was never achieved. You didn't finish. Probably for some of you, some of these things that I'm talking about are, are no big deals. Like you've maybe started a home improvement project like me and you never finished it. Maybe you started a car restoration project and you never really finished it. Maybe you said, I want to do a garden. And so you started doing that yard work and making that garden and you never finished it. Or maybe you set out for like a weight loss goal and you said, I want to lose 10 pounds, you know, after I've put on my COVID-19 and you started the diet and exercise program, but you never reached your goal. There's some of those kind of no biggies. Some of the other areas that we finish are a little bit bigger deals. Like we maybe set out to achieve an educational goal, but for one reason or another, you, you never finished. Or maybe you set out to start a business and you got things going, but you never saw it through. Or maybe you said, you know, we want to start saving for a home or something else in life. And so you started a savings plan, but things happened and you never achieved that savings goal. And so you've had to put off that thing that you've wanted to save for. There are other unfinished things in our lives that are far more tragic than those two. Like maybe your marriage. And no one goes into marriage thinking it's going to fail and you're not going to be able to end your marriage well together with each other, but sometimes things happen and they don't work out the way you, didn't, the way you wanted. And 
You didn't get to finish. Maybe it's for you, it's kicking some sort of addiction. And you started the road to recovery and the road to getting healthy again, but you just couldn't kick that addiction. Maybe for some of you, you set out, you said, you know what, I, I'm going I'm, I'm to put practices in my life to not allow sin to ruin the good things in my life. And you start out with maybe some accountability, you start attending church regularly, you start reading your Bible, you get some great friendships around you to help you stay on the, on the straight and narrow, but life circumstances happen and you start walking away from all those things that you know were good and, and sin has ruined what you started. One of the most tragic things that people start and never finish, in my opinion, is their walk with God. Well, I think one of the most tragic things that happens is when a new Christian walks away from their faith and doesn't finish well. We see it all the time. We see it all the time even here at Catalyst where people come and they surrender their life to Jesus and they say, yes, that's what I want. I, I need Christ in my life and I, I, I make that decision to follow him. Or maybe they even get baptized shortly thereafter publicly declaring their new faith in Jesus and, and they're white hot in the beginning of their faith, but then the world seems to come in and taint. Those old patterns seem to come back in and they made this declaration with their mouth and their early actions followed suit. But over time, things happen and they didn't finish what they started. There's even stories recently of, of prominent pastors in America who are not finishing strong whether it's through abuse or whether it's through sex scandals or it's through something else, we hear stories all the time of men and women, prominent men and women who are in ministry that tap out or they burn out or they, they do something that doesn't allow them to finish their ministry well. But on the other side of the coin, there's also great heroes of faith, people that we can look to that, that started following Jesus and now near the end of their life, they're still to this day following him and living out the purpose that God has given to them. I think within our Catalyst Church community, uh, one of the more beautiful pictures of that is our good friends Bob and Melva Gaynor. Bob and Melva are saints in this church. We love them dearly and they are nearing kind of the, the end of their life as they're getting older and we're praying for Melva as she's coming out of the hospital once again, but they've been married over 75 years and they've been walking with Jesus, all of them. And now as they are approaching the final seasons of their, of their lives, they, they can say that they've finished well. I think of my own father. Now my dad was the kind of guy that never finished a project never finished anything. But the one thing he did finish, and that's why I call him a hero of faith in my life, is that he finished his faith well. He never lost faith, and he walked with Jesus nearly his entire life until his very last breath when he saw the face of God. I don't know what your story is, and I don't know what the battles are that you're facing. I don't know all of what God's purpose is for your life, but I do know this. I know that God wants you to finish the race with him well. I know he wants you to finish strong because God wants you to, to be faithful to him for your entire life. That that declaration to follow him, however many years ago it was for you, becomes the last words of your life as well. Now, as we're progressing through the book of Acts, we, we, we've been following recently this man named Paul. Now, if you don't know a whole lot about the book of Acts or this person named Paul, let me tell you a little bit about him. Paul, his original name was Saul, and Saul was a Pharisee, which means he was a Jewish teacher and keeper of the law. He was the, he was the righteous ones within his community. And Paul was tasked early on with the movement of Jesus to squash it. In fact, he oversaw the stoning of the first uh, martyred disciple named Stephen. And Paul's job as a Pharisee was to literally squash the movement of Jesus. He would, he would find Christians, put them in prison, and in, especially in the case of Stephen, he oversaw his stoning and his execution. Now, on one particular day, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Saul. The resurrected Jesus appeared to Saul. And Saul, now called Paul, his life was converted and forever changed. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, because he saw him resurrected from the grave. 
And so there's this radical transformation within Paul's life where he goes literally from a terrorist to a church planter. It's one of the more radical conversion stories in all of the New Testament. Now, some of you even watching might say, yeah, that's kind of my story too. I was totally headed in one direction, anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-Bible, and I had a real encounter with the living God and it changed my life forever. And I did a 182. You know exactly what that's like, especially when in relation to Paul. But as we progress through Paul's particular story, we see beginning in Acts chapter 13, where Paul begins to to preach the gospel in various cities around what we would call Asia Minor. And as he preached the gospel and reasoned in the synagogues with both Jews and Gentiles, they would see and they would, con- they would see who Jesus was and they would convert to-, to following Jesus, essentially. And when he did that, he began planting churches all over the area with the new believers. One of those cities that became very near and dear to Paul's heart was the city of Ephesus. In fact, Paul spent three and a half years of his public ministry there in the city of Ephesus working with that church. And in Acts chapter 20, which is where we find ourselves in today's passage, Paul is essentially giving his farewell to this church in Ephesus. He's sitting down with the elders and the leaders of this church, and he's giving essentially his goodbye speech. He's saying goodbye to these people that he has dearly loved, And as I was reading this in my own devotional life this last week, there's a certain verse that stood out to me. It's verse 24, but I want to read a little section of what he reads here. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Acts chapter 20. We're going to start reading in verse 22. He says this to the church in Ephesus, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And as I was reading that in my own life, I thought, man, like what a great, like, prayer or a great declaration that Paul's making there. He says, my only aim at this point in my life is to finish the race and complete the task that God has given me, the task of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I read that, I said, wait a minute, I've heard that phrase somewhere else in Paul's writings. Paul says a very similar phrase to the church in Ephesus on a letter that he wrote to them as he's dying in prison near the end of his life. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says this at the end of his life to these same people. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And Paul writes these words at the end of his life as one of the saints in in the Christian faith that says, I have made it to the end. I finished what I started. I fulfilled the task that Jesus Christ gave to me in my life. And Paul writes this, this declaration in Acts 20, but there's nothing behind it. It's purely intentional. He says, this is what I want to do. This is where I think I am going. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And he gets to make that statement in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I've done it. I've done it. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I've fought that good fight with everything that I have. And I thought to myself, how did Paul bridge the gap between Acts 20 And 15 years later in 2 Timothy 4, what bridges the gap of his life that allows him to finish strong based upon that declaration in Acts chapter 20? So when I look at the life of Paul, I see a handful of things that he did that bridge that gap. And I want to give these to you uh, as an encouragement and maybe even a challenge to those of you that that are starting out your walk with God. That this is going to be a difficult road and many of you will actually fall away from the faith And you won't be able to make that statement at the end of your life. But if that's you, and you say, I want that verse that I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, to be your dying words, 
Let's follow Paul's example and the things that he did with his life. And so I have four things that I thought of that Paul did throughout his life that allowed him to bridge the gap between his intentions and his reality. And the first one is this, is that his conversion became his conviction. His conversion became his conviction. See, Paul's conversion occurred in Acts chapter 9, and it was the defining point of his life. His life, his life not only did a complete 180 degree turn, but so did his doctrine. His belief system about what he believed about God and his role in this world completely did a 180 degree turn. His conversion quickly became his conviction. See, Jesus in his earlier life was a political disruptor. But after his conversion, Jesus became Messiah, God in the flesh, as he referred to him as. See, prior to his conversion, Paul thought that Jesus was just a a dismissed rabbi and he was a leader of a cult that needed to be squashed. But after he had met Christ and he was converted, he declared that Jesus was the ultimate authority over his life and in fact the savior of the world. Talk about a 180 degree turn. This wasn't just an adaptation of a worldview Paul already had. It was a complete 180 degree turn. And so from that point forward, his worldview, his convictions were completely influenced by his conversion. In fact, one of my favorite, one of my other life verses is one, of, one in which um, Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. He implores a new pastor, Timothy, actually speaking again to the church in Ephesus. He says this to him. He encourages Timothy to watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, he says, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Paul's encouragement to us, he says, watch your life, meaning your actions or your convictions. Watch your life and watch your doctrine closely. He's saying, watch how you live and watch what you believe very closely. Hold on to those. Because either of those become a slippery slope of tapping out of this, of this walk with Jesus at any point in your life. You can make life decisions, life choices that will cause you to walk away from Christ and walk a different path. So watch the things that you do with your life, but also watch the things that you believe. You believe as a follower of Christ that the scriptures are the ultimate authority over that. Don't let that go. You believe that Jesus Christ is is your Lord and your Savior and He is God in the flesh. Regardless of what the world says around that, I want you to watch that and I want you to guard that closely because those things, if they are messed up in your life, if you neglect those, if you stray off on any of those, you might find yourself in a position to where you're no longer walking with Him. It's a problem that I see in so many Christians these days is that there's a conversion experience, but they don't watch their life, their convictions, and their doctrine closely. And so they give in, and they give up. See, Paul was convinced of several things. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 says that Paul was convinced of God's great love for him. He says in, in Romans 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height or depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He was convinced. And then again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, he says this, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all. And therefore all died. And he, meaning Jesus, died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Paul says, I'm not only convinced of God's great love and purpose for my life, but I'm also convinced of everything that Christ did for us. And he held on to those convictions for the rest of his life. See, for us in today's world, 
we have to do our diligence to watch our life and our doctrine carefully so that our conversion doesn't end there, but it becomes the convictions of who we are. And so the question we have to ask ourselves in light of this is how strong are your convictions? Can they withstand the storms of this life? Can they withstand the false teachings that this world continues to throw in front of us? Have your convictions become stronger since your conversion or have they become weaker? Because if you and I want to finish strong, we must hold on strongly to these biblical convictions as Paul did. Second thing Paul did was that his, he realized that God's promises needed to become the pillars of his life. So I say God's promises became Paul's pillars. See, throughout his life, Paul built his life on the promises of God. You know, on May 27th, 2000, Sierra and I made a promise to each other. We stood before friends and family in our church that we were working in, and we took our wedding vows that day. And we made a promise to each other that we were going to hold on and we were going to stay married through sickness and in health, through richer or poorer, through joy or sorrow, till death do us part. And in our relationship, I hold on to the promise that she made to me that day. And I know she does the same for me. For we made that promise to each other. And that promise is real. The promises that God makes to you and I are the, most, are the strongest, most concrete pillars that we can base our life on. In the same way, God doesn't promise that life is going to be great, but he promises that if we hold on to the promises that he has declared to us, we can withstand anything that life throws at us. Whether it's riches or poverty, whether it's sickness or it's health, God makes certain promises to us, and Paul knew those promises. He, in fact, said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he said that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion meaning the promises that God has for you, he will be the one to see you through that. And so we lean on those promises, and Christ makes promises to us. And Paul knew this. This was the story of his life. Of all the promises that are in Scripture, I think the three most powerful promises that that the Bible makes to us as Christians are the ones that we hold closely to. One of the promises that is made is that when we surrender our life to Jesus Christ, and we, and we receive the salvation that he has to offer to us, several things are promised to us in the Bible. One is that we are promised that our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. We are no longer held accountable for the sins of our lives in the eyes of God. We are completely and 100% forgiven of all of them. That's a promise. Another promise is that we will receive eternal life is that we, we are not, we're not just earthly beings. We have souls and we are eternal beings and everyone's going to spend eternity somewhere. But for those who are in Christ, the promise is that there is this eternity waiting for us, that God has a place that is prepared for every single one of us where we will be with him in perfection with new bodies and new hearts and new minds in a new world that he has given to those who have placed their faith and their trust in him. That's a promise. And the third promise that the New Testament makes to all Christians is that when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit enters into us. We have the presence of God that lives inside of us, that guides us and comforts us through life. And that Holy Spirit will change us from the inside out. Now Paul understood all of those promises to his core. And by leaning on those promises, in fact, making those promises a pillar of his life, Paul was able to finish strong because he didn't lean on the promises of man. He didn't lean on the promises of government. He didn't lean on the promises that he made up in his own mind. He didn't even rely on the promises of other faith systems and religions. For Paul knew that the promises of God found in Scripture were the promises that he was going to build his life upon. And so the question that I want to turn to us in that is, are you relying on the eternal promises of God? Or are you relying on the temporary promises of this world? If you want to finish strong, it's going to require you and I to hold on to the promises of God. Third thing I see in Paul's life is that his purpose became his passion. See, at his conversion, God gave him a specific purpose, and that was to be the missionary to the Gentile world, that he was going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, which he has done And we are living in the wake of all of Paul's missionary work. But Paul knew his purpose in life. 
And he went after it with reckless abandon and with great passion. And because of that, Paul was willing to endure everything that he went through. He was able to get to the finish line of his life because he was passionate about the purpose that God had given to him. His purpose had become his passion. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 26, he says this. He says, for me, or excuse me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I, am go, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Meaning, if I keep going and keep living, that means I continue to do the purpose that God has for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. See, there were times when Paul wanted to give up. He wanted to tap out. He wanted to go be with Jesus at times because he went through an enormous amount of persecution and pain. But he said, you know what? God is not done with me. I have a purpose. And you do too. I don't know what your purpose is in life. We're going to talk about that more in just a second. But I don't, I don't know what that is for you. But for Paul, he knew what his purpose was. And, and, he, and he fulfilled that purpose to the best of his ability throughout his entire life. Do you know your purpose in life? Do you know why God has still allowed you to live today? If you're older in life, why do you think God still has you here? Sometimes there's seasonal purposes that God has for us, and other times there's long-term purposes. But when you find out why God has you in the place that you're in, you can endure anything, and you can finish the race. Last thing, real quickly, is that Paul knew that his sufferings were his sanctification. Now, sanctification is a big Bible word, meaning that we become more and more like Jesus. See, for Paul, he suffered enormously. He was put in prison. He was beaten. He was cold. He went through all of the things that we would never want to go through for the sake of the gospel, but he endured them all because he knew that there was a greater purpose behind his sufferings. In fact, he says in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, we also glory in our sufferings, he says, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. He says that there is a purpose behind all the things that I go through in this life. He didn't allow his life to become bitter and angry and blaming God for the suffering that he went through. He always said, God, what are you trying to teach me in and through it? And how can you use my life for a greater purpose in the midst of my sufferings? See, here's the thing, is that all of us have a choice to make in our sufferings. We have a choice to become bitter, to run away from God, or to be angry at God. Or we can be like Paul and in the midst of the greatest sufferings of our life say, God, what is it that you're trying to teach me? God, I'm going to run to you and I'm going to follow you even more closely so that we get through this suffering together. He did not run because he knew that every level of suffering that he went through was for a greater purpose. All of these things. His sufferings became his sanctification. His purpose became his passion. His conversion became his conviction. And his purpose became his, uh, his passion. All of those things are the ways in which the Apostle Paul was able to, at the end of his life, say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul lived his life in such a way that he was able to finish strong. And my prayer for every single one of you, all of you watching, is that from the moment of your conversion to Christ, to the last breath that you take before you enter into eternity with God, would be filled with a life of joy and purpose and love, conviction with Christ, that we would be a people who would not tap out that we would not burn out, that we would not sin out, 
that we would not flame out, but that you would be able to, to endure and to finish the race that God has put out before you. I know that's the prayer of your heart. That's the prayer of my heart. I don't want to see any of you fall away for any of these reasons, but I want you to place all of your life in the hands of Jesus. Will you embrace the purpose he has for you? Will you finish the race well? Because the goal is not how we start. The goal is how we finish. That we may say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. God bless you guys. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a great day. I see the King of glory.
Father, we give you praise together. As a people that recognize you're the God who saves, you're the God who delivers. That's what that cry, Hosanna, means, a reminder of who you are, what you've done. Thank you for giving us a reason to sing and praise you together as a community. In Jesus' name, God's people say, amen. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for joining us today on Catalyst uh, Online. We are really grateful that you chose to take time to hang out with us um, this morning. I want to encourage you, as we heard in the message, how can you finish strong? That's something that maybe we don't often think about, like thinking about the end of the race, but it's never too soon as you're thinking, like, how can I finish this race well? How can, I, how can I be the most that God has called me to be and not fail in the midst of that, not stumble, but to finish my relationship and my call strong? And I hope that that is some good food for thought for you to chew on this week, maybe uh, with yourself or in a group or with your family, but hope that was a blessing to you. And again, we'd love to see you online on December 7th for Discover Catalyst to find out some more details and information about our story and some next steps for you. And you can register for that on our app or text Catalyst SP to 97000 and uh, fill out the digital connect card that's going to be texted back to you. We love you guys. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.